Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Once again, I'm Pastor Jeff Johnson here at First Lutheran, and welcome to the 37th season of the Linton Luncheon Series um, on this second one. Um, once again, uh, thumbs up for the food. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's give a hand to our kitchen staff. I've, they're eating themselves, eating next door themselves. They're not eating each other. <laughs> but anyway, I had to get that misplaced modifier correct there. I used to teach English, so I had to be careful about my own use of the language. Um, I, uh, Bill Kelly would be ashamed of me, but I am not a good joke teller. As most of this parish knows, Bill, Kel Bill Kelly's the joke teller here. But I do have one bad joke that I tell once a year, and some of you may remember it or not. And if you remember it, Bill Kelly, don't blurt out the answer. Uh, uh, what do you call us? Um, what do you call a sleepwalking nun? There we go. <laughs> so anyway, love that joke. It always makes me laugh. Okay, so um, today uh, on uh, this auspicious weekend of St. Patrick's Day, and, and I know what that means for this part of the world, um, we have Pastor Matthew Martin. I'm going to let him tell you about himself and the ministry he does with, in New Hunger in New England. There is lots of literature no, some literature on your tables and lots of food packets on your tables. And I've had this food before, and I will give my own personal endorsement. It's delicioso. Um, Nina Sousa, the parish um, executive assistant to the pastor, is passing out yellow cards. We had some last week about response. If you want to be put on our mailing list, if you want us to pray for you, if you want um, to... Um, compliment us about the meal or chide us about the meal, let us know. Um, obviously, we're on next week, and our speaker is Ann Boudreaux uh, with um, Brockton Count uh, City Council. Uh, Ward right, yeah, and so we're thrilled that she'll be here. I'm not exactly sure of the menu next week, but it is listed somewhere. I, I, seafood Newburgh. Oh, Seafood Newburgh. Wow. Evelyn Rubin, our uh, parish church secretary. Anyway, um, what else do we need to do? We need to pray and give thanks to God for this extraordinary meal. Let us pray. <coughs> Gracious God, thank you for today and for all the blessings of this life. Uh, and thank you for all good gifts because all good gifts come from you. We thank you especially the day for this extraordinary meal and the hands and the hearts that prepared it. Um, we thank you for the ministry of uh, Matthew and all of his colleagues and friends um, and ending this thing that um, Jesus has spoken about uh, centuries ago about, about hunger, not only our physical hunger, but our, our hunger for you in our lives. Bless this food that we're about to eat or have eaten and um, give us the grace and the knowledge and the love of you and always help us to remember those who have nothing to eat tonight and know where to lay their heads. All this we ask through your name that is holy. Amen. Amen. Matthew Martin. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm going to do uh, an introduction, but this is going to be participatory. So you need to open this first. So there should be a bunch of these in the middle of your table. <clears throat> and you'll see if you just open the flap, there's a bunch of different kind of meals which are actually on bags, in bags on your tables. But there's a bunch of people here, and you recognize most of them. The ones you don't recognize in the middle there uh, are my boss and his wife. <clears throat> How many know, of you know what a Rotarian is? Or you are a Rotarian? Okay. It's a business person that's socially minded. Uh, their whole thing is service above self. So a lot of people go into business, and it's all about the bottom line, about self. But there's business people out in every community across the country that believe otherwise. <clears throat> and they really make an impact uh, locally. My boss is a Rotarian. So uh, he made the mistake of going on a medical missions trip with some friends who were doctors and nurses uh, just as he was retiring. He and his wife had planned on sailing the world. But when you go on a missions trip overseas for the first time and you live in central Iowa, you see stuff you've never seen before, like starvation. And they ended up just repurposing. They took the money they were going to spend on the sailboat, they liquidated it, uh, got maize, which is like corn, <clears throat> they barter traded with a bunch of local women whose children were starving to death but had these really wonderful sweet grass baskets. And if you've been a part of an event uh, that we've done before, like in the first half of the, the local 
uh, thing that we've been doing for eight years, you might have seen some East African crafts because we used to actually sell them at the events. Um, now the home office covers that all through our website, but basically 900 women have now received microfinance loans. They own their own businesses and they feed about 200,000 hungry people in their neck of the woods, Tanzania, Kenya area, just off of something they were already doing, but now they trade them for food and uh, clean water projects and medical care and education and subsistence agriculture farming. It's just exploded over there. <clears throat> and that's actually my boss's passion. So now after 15 years and 527 million hungry people fed, most of what they're focusing on, they've been over there every four months for the last 15 years. So after 45 trips, now that's their, where their focus is. Um, their son has taken over uh, the domestic side of things. So in the 15 years we've been doing this, <clears throat> I'm just gonna ask you to just fast forward five of those years. So 10 years ago, uh, my wife and I were uh, living in the Midwest. We were 45 minutes from my in-laws lake home that they retired to. We had two little kids, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. <clears throat> she was a teacher, uh, had a master's in elementary ed. I have two master's degrees. I was a Lutheran pastor like Jeff, just not as good looking and distinguished. Um, but I was doing the pastor gig, but <clears throat> I was always serving with one or two other pastors. I was at huge churches in the Midwest doing that mission work and youth ministry and doing that. And we were told by a pastor, a colleague of mine, I just met at a conference. Uh, we were talking about clergy debt uh, because to be a Lutheran pastor, you have to have a master's. Um, and if it's a clergy couple, they're likely to have almost $100,000 in school loans. <clears throat> just getting out into a rural North Dakota parish or something, it's how is this gonna work? And so we played a little game at lunch called who has the most school debt? And I won because I still have over $100,000 myself um, to get those two master's degrees. Um, I grew up in a home, uh, broken home. My mother was a waitress, my dad was a truck driver. We didn't have any money. Uh, we always had food and we always had somewhere to live, but it was income subsidized. And <clears throat> so I went to the same colleges that Ken went to a few years before me, met my wife there. She was the other poor kid on campus and uh, we married and did this crazy thing. Um, so the pastor that I was talking to across the table was actually living across the state in Rochester. Is anybody familiar with the Mayo Clinic? You heard of that? Her husband was a doctor and she was a pastor like me and they didn't have school loans. He maybe did, but he was making a lot of money to pay him off. But they did have a vacation spot they went to every year in Virginia. But they were too busy pastoring and doctoring. They couldn't go, <clears throat> found out about all the debt we had and said, do you ever go on vacation? like ever? And I said, well, we haven't been on vacation for five years because that's when we had our daughter. And she said, we're giving you our vacation thing for a week. So I don't know if you remember back in the day, um, eight and a half years ago, they were doing a vote on uh, human sexuality. And I took that week off and went to Virginia. Uh, There's two other pastors at my church um, doing what they did. And we were there just relaxing, being still, knowing that God was God. And um, my wife woke up probably halfway through the week and said, we need to move to New England. <clears throat> and I said, um, what states are in New England? Re like, really? I think we've been there once. We went to Bar Harbor once, years ago. Like, why? And she said, I have no idea, but we just have to move there. Okay, call the bishop. I was like, oh, I have to find out who the bishop is in New England. Um, I knew nothing about that. So in Minnesota, one out of four uh, people is Lutheran. In New England, one out of 200 people is Lutheran. It's very different culture and climate. Um, when we came, we noticed basically everybody was Catholic, Congregationalist, or Atheist. That was the population. And, uh, but Margaret Payne said, wow, we've got this perfect church in Quincy. And I said, all right, I've figured out now New England is six states. Which state is that one in? Um, and they, she said, oh, it's just south of Boston. Um, John Adams, John Quincy Adams lived there. Uh, is this ringing a bell? I said, no, but I'll check it out when we get there. So we um, relocated, it took about six months with the call process, and we arrived. We had, over a course of four and a half years, packaged enough of these meals, and if you can see the one that says fortified rice and bean meal, it's kind of the brownish one. This was the only meal there was except no pinto beans, so it was just a really bland rice-based meal with protein and vitamins and minerals. But we had done enough to feed a million people, but everybody we fed was overseas. It was in East Africa or somewhere <clears throat> um, where they had an overseas connection. Well, we moved here, and the very next day, the Haiti earthquake happened. And that year, the outreach program gave Haiti 50 million meals. It was huge. 
and we started packaging meals with them. <clears throat> I had worked with somebody else in the Midwest, but they said, you know, our reach just is the biggest group who does this is called the Outreach Program. I will connect you to Floyd and Kathy, and you can do meals there too, but we just can't. I'll send you with one assembly line. So we started uh, feeding 200 orphans in Haiti right away. Well then, fast forward a year, year and a half, and our um, social ministry chair said, um, aren't there hungry kids in Quincy? Like, I bet you there's some kids in Quin Quincy that would eat this meal because they're hungry. Well, we had Synod Assembly that uh, June, <clears throat> and we had been working for a year on trying to figure out what the point of being Lutheran was in New England because there's so few of us. And we came up with a purpose statement that was to go where love leads, and we're like, <laughs> we moved here, um, serve where love calls. And I was like, we have been packaging these meals, and I just found out this very weekend that one out of four American kids is going to bed hungry. And one out of three kids in Maine. It was, it was ridiculous. And I found out that at the time we had the um, most hungry people we will hopefully ever have on the planet. It was a billion, but there were seven billion people on the planet at the time. So it was one out of seven on our globe was hungry, but one out of three kids in Maine. So we just shifted. We're Vikings fans, so we punt a lot. I don't know if that doesn't happen with the Patriots, but um, we just said, you know what, these three master's degrees, we'll just kind of, Heidi couldn't find a teaching job Then the 18 months we were here, and um, she had a master's degree. So in Massachusetts, you have to have one to be a teacher for more than five years. And it just wasn't happening. So she had started writing. So over in the other room, I've got uh, some examples of hers, but uh, Jeff was kind enough at Calumet to do a, a summer book study, and we still get great feedback from people about that, how they experienced that. But she's written a children's book now and a novel, and she's working on her second novel. The neat thing is all the proceeds from these go to feed more hungry kids. <clears throat> so Heidi's fed about a quarter of a million hungry people already. At the very beginning, this little girl named Lucy, I also have some of her CDs over there, did a project with us, and she's fed over a million. She's 14 years old now. Um, but she has a daughter of a friend of mine from high school and college. Um, and everybody, as this thing started to emerge, was, was doing what they could do to make it happen. You guys have had the largest food pantry on the South Shore for many, many years. And so right away, we did a little tiny event at one of your um, huge meal events. It was in the fall, I can't remember what it was, but it was a lot of food. And we were in the food pantry, just showing people kind of how this meal packaging thing works. So this church, all these churches within our conference, a bunch of Lutherans and Methodists and Congregationalists and some atheist humanists at Harvard got this thing rolling, and it went from those four groups to 82 different kind of groups now. The neat thing is we've fed 27.5 million people, but Lutherans have fed 10 million of those people. Just on Martin Luther King, we hit that. So you can imagine 81 different kind of groups have done 17.5 million, and Lutherans have done 10 million. And there's not very many Lutherans here. <laughs> That's the whole point. Um, but they just jumped on board. If they had a food pantry, they started taking the meals to hand them out. Um, we had just this one. And then if you have one of the mac and cheese ones, it's the yellow one. We just had those two kinds. Because when I found out at Synod Assembly, I was supposed to go where love leads and serve where love calls. And that one out of four American kids was going to bed hungry. I called my, who became my boss, I called Floyd up and said, um, do you ever feed hungry people like in America? And he said, you know, the interesting thing is um, we just met with all of the leadership we've ever had uh, part of this organization. It's kind of a small group, but we said, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to create a domestic meal with our international meal, just put pinto beans in it, and we're going to do a mac and cheese. It's going to be an easy mac. And we think those meals would go locally, so we're going to start packaging those. But we wanted someone to try this out in somewhere we've never been in the country. We want like a guinea pig to be a regional person, not like in our home office in Iowa, but like a regional somewhere. But there's really only one part of the country where we've never done one of these events before. Where do you live? And I said, We're, we live on South Shore Boston. He's like, we've never packaged a meal in the Northeast before. Do you want to give this a shot? <laughs> I was like, go where love leads, serve where love calls. Uh, sure. So um, after we got the call 18 months into it, I decided to help. If any of you have heard of Sanctuary in Marshfield, or now there's a church in Plymouth, um, it was a Lutheran pastor trying to work with some Methodists to get a church off the ground. They'd been trying on the South Shore about 30 years, and nothing ever stuck. Well, for the first time ever, this like Reese's peanut butter cup worked, or it had started working. Um, Mark Huber, his wife Sarah, is our creative director at the church. They had about 20 people interested. He arrived in New England from Ohio about four to six months before I did. So they were kind of getting stuff off the ground. I said, hey, Mark, I have a wife and two kids. 
like we'll join your church. My kids will be 40% of the youth group, but like we'll, we'll be a part of it. And, but you have to help me start this meal packaging thing. <clears throat> On May 18th, we will have our 18th event at Sanctuary. Um, we've done like 918 of these events now over the last eight school years. The cool thing about it is the funds and the volunteers always come from the local community. So if we were doing one right here in this space, you would have raised the money to get the product, the bags, the boxes, all that stuff, and you would have gotten the volunteers. We've worked with a one-year-old to a 99-year-old. So I always tell people you can bring your granddaughter or your grandma or both because we always have multiple generations at any given event. And then the meals stay in your community. So now we've created a kind of a word of mouth network. So other than the pantry that's in this building, if you want to take one of these cards and one or more of these sample bags and hand it to anybody that has a backpack program, a homeless shelter, another food pantry, you can just tell them, you can get these meals for free and there's seven different kinds. All you have to do is email this guy. For the last 15 years, we've been able to feed a kid for a quarter the most nutritious meal they've ever eaten. It's 21 vitamins and minerals and 11 grams of protein. And this bag costs a buck 50 and it feeds six people. So a hungry kid gets to eat for a quarter and has it always since they started doing this, since Floyd and Kathy retired. Um, but all of those meals have to go out locally to somebody um, for free because the group who does it gets the money and the people to actually do it. We show up, myself or one of my staff people show up to run your event. And you guys have done one at the high school. Like I said, we did that little one here. Uh, the first year, but those meals go out. So the only way we know where the meals should go is because somewhere somebody t said, used the word of mouth approach, we don't spend any money on this part, saying, hey, you can get these meals for free. Or hey, we just packaged a bunch of these meals. We're gonna put them on our food pantry. And then they go out. So now there's hundreds of different places that say, um, we want more of those meals, please. Like your pantry could order as many bags as you want. It's funny you tell that Catholic joke because I'm telling that at, now at both of these events coming up. We have uh, 13 events in the last 14 days of this month. And two of them are giant, our two biggest events for that time period are two Catholic churches. One is in Hingham and one is in Duxbury. And they're going to compete against each other to um, see who can feed the most people. But you could literally, they're doing every kind of meal we have. The only bag you're not seeing on the tables is because we haven't packed it yet, is a cheesy rice. So now there's three kind of pasta meals, three kind of rice meals, and an instant oatmeal. But they're all, if you compare the, our Easy Mac to Kraft Mac and Cheese, ours is five times as nutritious. So ours are all about the same nutritionally, and uh, compared to Kraft, it's five times as nutritious. So it's really easy to make. You boil water, it's really nutritious, and it's really inexpensive for a group to produce a bunch, or it's free for a pantry to get as many meals as they want. So that was like drinking through a fire hydrant. <coughs> uh, if you uh, have any questions in particular, or you wanna uh, look at the meals, I would really encourage you to uh, share these cards and these meals with uh, anybody you know that's in the trenches feeding people because um, all our meals have to go somewhere and we do a ton of them right around this area. So before I get to that, I did want to do one follow-up. Um, we created this t-shirt once we had the CDs and the books and stuff for uh, rewards to give to people that donate at events or, or for a particular event. You have a lot of opportunities. Uh, the Blessings in a Backpacker is actually getting meals from both of those Catholic events and Hingham Dexter I'm talking about. I drove past a church that just did a gigantic event in November. Um, just that month, we packed 1,000 cases, which would have fed 216,000 people just in the Boston metro area. But our largest event was a church with 23 worshipers in Abington, a Lutheran church called uh, Join Christ. They did an event you could easily have gotten or can get to their event this November to grab meals from them because it's like 13 minutes away. Um, we're doing it at Sanctuary again, obviously, in May, which isn't that far from you uh, uh, right now. To, if you've got a way to get the meals, you just literally have to email me and, and say how many you want and what kind, and I'll make sure I can make that happen. I saw a question over here and one over here. What's the actual cost? So this uh, bag, when you uh, produce it, Everything that went into funding that, so from the product that's inside it to the bag to the box it goes into when you receive it to the hairnet we put on to the gloves to get me there, all that kind of stuff is it's a quarter a serving. So that bag will uh, cost a buck fifty to produce and it'll feed six people. And it's been that way for 15 years. Nicely enough, in the last eight years, it was one out of seven people on the planet, one out of four kids in America, one out of three in Maine. It is now one out of nine on the planet one out of six American kids, but one out of five in Maine. And there is still one county in Maine that's one out of four. Uh, Piscataquisk, if you oh, can find that. You need, we need to be put out of business. 
Yes, and that's my hope, um, is that in my lifetime, I'm 44, um, there will come a time where we don't have the needs we have or we will be meeting. There'll be a system like we have here of people generously giving to the food bank so you can get food. Um, the fresh fruits and vegetables, the flash frozen meat that's in your freezers is awesome. But our meal is a meal and you boil water to make it. So if you're not taking a culinary class at the food bank, you know, on how to, what to do with these vegetables and with this meat and whatever, um, our meals are all uh, vegetarian. So if you have, even have a dietary restriction, but you have to eat, you can get your nutrition through something like this. So a lot of the meals get pushed to the front of the food pantry instead of, you know, they all, all want fresh fruits and vegetables, certainly, and, and meat if they eat it, but our meals are just really popular because they taste good and they're easy to make. Are these for sale or are they just reserved for, for the need? For? Exactly. So um, one of the Catholic churches I'm going to, which I think will, after this month, hold the largest Catholic event we've ever done, and it's every event they've ever done has been the largest Catholic event we've ever done. During Lent, they have... Um, provided those, they, they keep some stock back from their previous event, and they sell them to their parishioners because everybody needs a simple meal. You can't eat meat on Fridays during Lent. So they people have been buying them for 20 bucks a bag because they know 80 people get to eat because I bought this thing, and my family of six will get to eat. Um, so that's the only time I've ever heard of people selling them. Um, we produce them. Uh, essentially, you produce them. If you do an event, you got the money and the people to do it. I just helped you put them together. So you can do whatever you want with them, but they are meant to be given out locally for free to people in need in your neighborhood. And some of the places I've been, the national average for you know, hungry kids, if you're talking one out of six, is like 17%. There's like 50%. I was in one area where it was over 90% of the kids were hungry. Like literally every kid who went to school was having free and reduced breakfast and lunch. And if there was a snow day or a week off or two months off for the summer, you'd better hope there was a feeding program established somewhere because those kids just weren't eating. I don't know if you remember four years ago when we got like nine feet of snow. Some people just, oh, surprise, you're not going to go to school for three weeks. And if these weren't, didn't go home in backpacks and they didn't have them, uh, unfortunately, one out of 30 kids in our country has no idea where they're going to sleep tonight either. Uh, but one out of six being hungry, we just have to stock these. We have uh, rotary clubs all the time that get the different meals and, and put them in bags and hand them up, off the bus. Every kid, if you've got over half the kids are hungry, you don't know which ones are hungry, but they just give them to every kid if there's a risk of weather. Uh, there's a risk of a week off of school for a school break. <laughs> My kids are really excited, but a lot of kids aren't because they get to eat at school. Do you want us to pass these back in to you? Well, I have a couple more presentations, but if you have somewhere to take a card in one of the sample bags to somewhere other than this pantry, please take it and talk to the person and say, I was just at this amazing lunch, and I heard about this, seven kinds of meals, you get them for free, just email this guy, please, and then I can get them connected. <clears throat> we always have groups that say, hey, we want to give meals away. Um, who gets them? And now I have like a dozen emails for every county in New England uh, of places where they've gotten them, they want them again. They might place an order, like I said, proactively contacting me and saying, God, we just love 100 boxes of that mac and cheese. Can you connect us to an event? And then at that event in their area, I can tell that group, um, these are all claimed. Like, let's do mac and cheese because that's what they want. They know there's seven kinds, but they want half beans and rice and half tomato basil pasta. Let's do those because that's what their clientele is going to want. Yeah. Um, so that's why we, we pack the different variety. It isn't just for this fun that the volunteers get to do different kind of food. It's for the people that are receiving it in the trenches and know their clients what they will eat. Um, a lot of times they'll eat anything. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of meal it is, if it's a breakfast meal or a lunch or supper, but they just want some food they can get in their bellies. I was homeless for three months in college. Um, nicely enough, I did own a car and had two pizza delivery jobs. So although I had to eat pizza 180 times in a row because it was free, I had food. And my passion is nobody, no kid, the average age of a homeless person in Massachusetts is eight. Across our nation, it is nine. There's no kid that's in single digits that should worry, where am I going to sleep and when am I going to eat again? And that's what, why I do what I do. So any other questions? I don't know how much time I have left. but no, you're, you're great on time. And, and I think that this is a vital, vital question. I'm and I, as a further endorsement to you, um, when I used to work with the homeless in San Francisco, um, we used to feed on the streets after, and one of the things that was consistent with a lot of homeless people or people who are indigent or whatever you want to describe that as, is they were not eating healthily, and we provided a hot meal 
that was homemade, and you can imagine this, for roughly 100 people on at a train station. You can imagine people brought gallon buckets, vats of soup in their cars and dropped it off the Mission Park station. But the, po the point I've made, that I noticed over the years was that consistently homeless people eat the worst food, donuts, sugar, carbohydrate, I mean, just the, the sweets all the time uh, for a variety of reasons. But here, and this was what's great about this, is that you're handing a child a healthy meal rather than something that's full of empty calories or sugar or meaningless carbohydrates, but you know, there's thought and care around what we're handing you. And that there's, they have to be able to make it too. So there's, it's not just handing somebody a fish, you've got to be able to fish in a way with it. So anyway, I, was, I, I wax on. Um, so the, lar the um, one out of four kids in the state of Mississippi is still hungry uh, to this day. Um, the lar largest um, obesity rate in our country uh, among kids is in Mississippi. So a lot of people think, Oh, if you eat a lot, that's, you're fat and happy, right? No, when you eat complete crap, empty calories, that's when you are a kid and you're eight and you're 100 pounds because you just, you're so hungry all the time. You can't think. You just want some, and that's why it's better to hand a kid a banana when they come into school than anything else because it just gets some, some energy right now, nutritious food, and then the meals they can make for themselves. Uh, or if you're cooking a hot meal for a bunch of people, you can hand these out at that meal. Because all they got to do is get to boiling water in their shelter or wherever they are. Um, where I'm from in Plymouth County, my part of Plymouth County, in Plymouth, there's a couple hundred people that live in the woods. They can get to a, a um, I don't know if you heard, I'm sure you all heard about on the North Shore, they had all those fires. They were handing out camp stoves because if they can just get to boiling water, you can eat a meal like this. Um, but yeah, you'll make it on a campfire if you have to, just to be able to eat something that's good for you. Any other questions about... This journey, basically your church and a bunch of others helped start this whole thing and we've now fed 27 and a half million people. Um, so you are one of the rare churches that not only had the, the gusto to make it happen and partner with other churches in the area, I know you've been to Joy in Christ Packaging with them, but you also have the largest food pantry on the South Shore, so you're doing like both sides of the equation. And that's where we're challenging people to do now. It's great that we do 100 or 150 events every year and people get money and volunteers and they pack food and it goes out but we also want to continue to make these connections. It's all via email, so some food pantry or backpack program director, I just have to have the current email address for the person who's in charge of getting the food, and then it allows us to get that process going. We pack so many meals that we just want places for them to go. Um, if we can't find places locally, we've got one group that, from Connecticut that will drive a couple hours up and grab every meal they can for Haiti. It's not like we don't have places for the meals to go no matter how many we pack, but the idea was I gave up a uh, parish of 150 people, I was to shepherd them for years, and I, my parish became the 8 million hungry people a day's drive from my house that were hungry in nine states. 2 million people in New England at the time. Now it's 1.6 million. So we've had a 20% drop in hunger, and we've done, we're doing more meals now than we've ever done, so we've had a many-fold uh, production increase. So hopefully at some point... You're out of business, and I, we've got enough of these meals in people's hands that no one ever has to go hungry. Thank you, Let's give Matthew a hand. I'm sure we can entertain questions. We even came up with some ideas while you were talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here and caring about hungry people in your neighborhood. <laughs>